first uh, this attack for the presentation. And, uh, uh, about us, uh, uh, for example, I am uh, I am blockchain developer. Uh, at the moment, I am working as a lead developer plus a data architect as well. And more than uh, approximately 20 years uh, experience as a developer. And uh, I started and then modern application, and then these days microservice-based architecture uh, we are using, and clouds we are using. And uh, my business partner is Alper. He has also so much finance experience. Uh, predominantly, our experience on finance, especially corporate banking, uh, private banking, and investment banking. Uh, and, uh, Time to time, we are uh, we are managing different roles. Uh, we have so much experience uh, as an employee, also as an employer. Uh, we want to share our experience with you guys. Uh, uh, we are we are managing corporate trainings uh, on these days. Yes. Digital digital transformation. Uh, uh, every company needs some some transformation projects uh, because technology is changing so fast. Uh, like, uh, you know, uh, I think five years before BlackBerry, everybody was remembering the BlackBerry, but today nobody knows. And uh, Nokia is a big, uh, you know, uh, things for the technology world. Like these things, technology is changing so fast. Uh, that's why uh, a, a company is trying to transform their technologies with latest technology because uh, <coughs> on these days microservice architecture is so popular, so important. And also I believe the microservice is very good things, but it's not easy to manage. Yes, we know these things, but I work on a mainframe system, you know, in a single file, more than 20,000 lines business it contains. It is not easy to migrate to different technology. That's why still when you go to banks, big banks, HSBC, Lloyds, Barclays, still so much business runs on the uh, mainframe system. That's why on these days we are implementing microservice uh, so much because we want to uh, make everything agile. So transform for the next technology. That's why uh, we are uh, we focus the corporate trainings. We are doing blended learnings, uh, skill gaps, talent management, continuous learning. Also, we believe, uh, uh, as I said, uh, on this day, technology uh, changing so fast, and companies they have limited resource, they have limited employee. That's why uh, you have to give them different options to uh, to upskilling. That's why we are offering them different kind of options: face-to-face -face virtual classroom, webinars, being simulation, assessment, one to one. Yeah. According to. Uh, yeah. Welcome. Hi. You didn't miss anything, but why, why did you make it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as I said, these are the part of the corporate trainings. Uh, for the face adaptation to technology, we are offering different kind of options. You know, upskilling is so important uh, for the employee. You know, we believe if a company <coughs> invests for their employee, they loyalty increase. You know, many people think opposite, but we believe these things because if somebody is happy what they are doing. And Korean, <coughs> uh, as a training center, we are doing so much coaching se uh, session. Most of them free. Uh, you can uh, come to us. We can discuss about the latest trends. And we are doing boot camps as well. Uh, more than three months uh, trainings. Uh, we are saying, uh, you know, uh, as a boot camps, uh, we are teaching to candidates by the parts in a long term training, Scrum Agile, Git, Jira, CI, CD. These are the uh, important for the uh, for the candidates. 
Because if you know these things by the path, you, uh, you will adapt your team in a short time. When they talk about uh, we will make tomorrow daily stand-up meeting, you should understand. You should know what will you talk on this meeting, right? You know, uh, and Git, you can be perfect developer in your home, but at the end, if you are working in a company, your program should uh, should integrate, should be integrated with one ecosystem. That's why you need to uh, version it should report and then uh, it should integrate with CI CD for the ecosystem integration. And Jira is, a, as you know, uh, uh, most of the IT projects managed by uh, via Jira. Uh, it, it supports so many plugins. You can manage your Kanban project. Uh, Scrum Agile project, also Monolith application. Uh, Monolith uh, waterfall project you can manage with Jira. If you know these things, you will be uh, very strong on the market and you will gain real, uh, real life experience. That's why uh, our boot camps, uh, we are expecting days, we are applying some pressure, sprint based pressure to candidate as well to make. Uh, ready for the real life. And uh, as I said, we have so many options uh, as a training. Uh, weekend time, after job, weekdays, and as I said, as a boot camp, more than one month training, we have so many options. If you have any, uh, if you have any suggestion to us about the technology, you can suggest. And we are, we are hiring professional guys from the market as well. And plan seminar, uh, you can uh, follow us from our social social media, from Meetup, Eventbrite, LinkedIn, and other social media things. And uh, current training, uh, as I said, we have approximately 20 years experience experiences. We uh, we are good on Java, but uh, as a person, I am blockchain developer. I am good on Hyperledger especially in the SDK about identity, also uh, JavaScript training. I am working as a data architect. Alper, he is good on DevOps side as well. He is good on Java side. As I said, we are hiring from the market so many professional guys as well. If you want, uh, if you want to give training, we are open to any kind of collaboration as well. Come to me and share your ideas. We can open training as well. That's all from me. And Mr. Alper, I will uh, give a word to him. Here is a uh, DevOps experience on the cloud with us. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alper Atay. Uh, I'm a software developer for about uh, 20 years, but I've got some DevOps experience, but not uh, officially, not professionally. Mostly, I was I, I am on the developer side. Nowadays, even if you are a developer, you have to deal with Jenkins, GitHub, and other stuff as well. So, at some point, you need to know about them sooner or later. And uh, I just want to share some experience, some of my experiences with you. Well, uh, last week we talked about. Uh, Jenkins on premises. We had, we, we, we didn't have enough resources. That's because uh, you need more than one computer if you want to use distributed resources. So we just did some, uh, we just create some pipelines, but they were, they were straight away. Uh, today uh, we will do the same for AWS. And uh, I've got some. Uh, extra examples if you if you are interested so you can go there and you can just follow it uh, but the problem is uh, most of them uh, will cost you that's because for example there is a uh, <coughs> AWS code deploy example with AWS code commit etc uh, but it uses so many resources so I, I'm not sure how much it will cost you. I mean, 
for one or two hours, maybe it won't cost you anything, but after that, it will be, you need to pay the credit. So, okay, uh, generally speaking, uh, all the DevOps idea uh, is coming with Agile, so Agile development. Well, I remember that, I think it was 15 years ago or something like that, I was working in a company as a consultant that uh, one of the leading GSM companies in Turkey approached me uh, for, for a position and they asked me that they need someone who understands about Java and uh, Linux and Windows as well. And uh, they were looking for someone who won't be coding, but understands the coding practices as well as best practices, but who will be uh, monitoring and fine tuning the services and the servers. And uh, I choose, you no, know, I, I want to continue as a programmer. But yes, I think uh, the time was not, <laughs> well, uh, was not good enough. I mean, uh, right now I can understand their vision, but on that time, no, I didn't. So uh, that's how uh, DevOps thing works. And uh, well, basically in agile development, all we are doing is uh, we are splitting the tasks to smaller pieces. And uh, in smaller teams, what we are, what we care is uh, delivering the most viable project as soon as possible, so that customers can, uh, stakeholders uh, can see about the vi vi visual about the project, and then uh, they can give us feedback, so that we can, in next sprint, we can do new, new modifications, etc. So uh, we will. It mostly depends on feedback and. That was one of the main problems, especially for the big projects, if you are using a methodology like waterfall, because basically after three or four months later, you, you will be discovering that uh, you are missing something. And uh, it was basically too, too late to turn back. So uh, continuous integration is part of uh, CI, CD, which we are talking about Jenkins today. It, 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 it is a CI CD integration. So continuous integration, and uh, we will be talking about uh, continuous deployment as well. So continuous integration is, is a development strategy that increases the speed of the development while ensuring the quality of the code that, that teams deploy. So basically, uh, in this kind of development, every developer commits daily to a shared mainline code repository, and every commit triggers some tests and builds so that uh, we will be able to understand that uh, we, we will be able to merge, uh, merge the shared main, mainline. So we will have a uh, we will have the latest and merge repository day, on daily basis. That's how uh, Jenkins also existed. Because uh, the reason that the guy who developed Jenkins was, uh, the, he was working at Sun as a, pro, a software developer. And what he needed was uh, to do lots of comics so that developers won't be conflicting with each other. Because basically, as a, a, especially in big, bigger projects, what you will experience is if you try to commit after you work three days or four days in functionality, there is a big possibility that someone else also commented something, so you will have conflicts and you have to review what has changed and then fix that conflict. Continuous integration uh, is, the, is a methodology which allows us to overcome this problem. So basically, it improves developer pro pro uh, sorry for it. it improves 
developer productivity because uh, they don't need to deal with the manual tasks. And basically, all you need to do is commit to a shared repository. And uh, if the code fails for a reason, then it will turn back. You need to fix it. Especially, there are some uh, other components that you could integrate with uh, Jenkins so that uh, you can also, like Sonar Cube, uh, you can also force developers to use best practices or company based coding standard or work definitions, work done definitions. It also uh, allows you to find and address bugs quicker because you, you will have the you will have something work something working and merge with each commit so that you could also you, you could always see if it is working great or not and yes deliver updates it, it allows you to deliver updates faster because we are continually continually integrating it you are not waiting for others to finish something so how this is happening you need a single source repository. So everyone they develops the software on their own systems and then they are using the same single source repository. And it automates the build. So when I commit something, it automatically detects it from GitHub or Git and uh, gets the latest ex executable, runs it, and then builds it. So it automates the build. Make your build self-testing because uh, you need to make your self-tests. And every commit should build an integration machine because every commit uh, integrated with each other. You need to keep the build fast and test the clone of production environment. That's something important because basically in production environment, it's your only chance to understand if the uh, software works as same as in production environment. So you need to be, uh, you need to have the exact same environment. Twenty years ago, I, uh, I remember that uh, we were developing Java software and most of it's GSP or something like that. And yes, sometimes. We need to change GSP pages so that it compiles on the on test system or live system or whatever. So we could, we could bypass the problem. Uh, but that was also breaking the integrity between the test system and the production system because uh, basically if something deploys, or if something happens, it regenerates the pages. So. Uh, both, your both systems must be uh, must be same as other, and it makes uh, it easy for to get the la the latest executable version for everyone. So in most of the projects, you will also get the nightly builds. That's because they also they are also using CI CD. So basically, they have at least one latest version per day. <coughs> And everyone can see what is happening. It also automates the deployment. So basically, all I need to concentrate is coding. Then I am committing it. And if there is something wrong, then it turns me back. I mean, it gives failure. So I cannot commit, commit it to the repository. I need to fix the errors. And once I need to, once I fix the errors, then I could commit it to commit. Uh, repository. And the thing is, those errors also defines uh, my work done definition or project's work done definition. So if we think about the process, here is our sort control. So when I commit it, commit, commit my changes, it automatically goes and builds and it runs the build tests as well. So this is the continuous integration part of it. After it is built, then basically there is two things happening. One of them is continuous delivery, the other one is continuous deployment. So uh, I'm taking 
my files to staging file, which I will again test my build and do integration tests, loss tests, and some other tests because uh, this is the state that, that before the production, I'm using before the production, and then I'm deploying it to the production server by using continuous deployment or continuous delivery. So developer checks the code to their private workspaces when everything is finished. They commit the changes to the repository, and then this state begins automatically. CI server monitors the repository and check out changes when they occur, and then CI server uh, builds the system and run the unit states so that we will be sure that uh, code is working like planned. And then uh, it releases the deployable artifacts for testing, and then it assigns a build label to the version of the code it just built. For example, in the company that I'm contracting, uh, we have got two days in a week that uh, a committee is uh, getting together and uh, allowing or denying the uh, code base changes. So if we want to take if we want to take something to production, uh, we need to be wait one of those two days, and they we will give them the build label and why we are doing this change, and what we are fixing, and if there is any symptoms or if there is any cause, we are also reporting that reporting it, and they are deciding if we could take it to production or not. If they decide it could be taken to the production, then we have to use the same build label so that uh, we will be going to the production. This means that we are not using continuous deployment, we are using continuous delivery. Because basically, I'm always delivering, I'm always committing, and when I commit something, it goes to the product, a uh, staging server. But for from staging server to production, I need to approve. It's not automatic. It is my improvement before going to production. And then CI server informs the team of successful build. So it's, it, it sends you a message or mail. If it fails, it again uh, sends you a mail message that the, the build is failed, so you can go and see why it is failed and who deployed it, so you can easily understand that where is the problem in most cases. If it fails, then it alerts all the team. Team fixes the issue at the earliest opportunity because that's the only way that you, you could push something to the repository. And this, this is done on continuous basis. So your project is uh, tested on daily basis. Uh, your code is reviewed on daily basis. And it's always tested for your coding standards and uh, work definition, work done definition. And you will always have the latest version on daily basis by using CI, CD. So here is the, here is, uh, illustration of it. Here is my code when I commit it. First, I have, the, I have got the continuous integration pipeline, which I do build unit test and integration test. So I will be sure that the code is working fine. And then there is the CD, continuous delivery and deployment pipeline. And in here, I'm doing a review staging and then production. So before taking anything to staging as well, I'm doing a review. So I will check if the code is good in good shape or not. So if I merge, merge it, is it still working as expected? And then I'm putting it to staging. And if everything's, everything's fine, then I can 
take it to the production. I could do this process from staging to production automatically or by improvement. That depends on me. And uh, here it shows the uh, difference between continuous uh, deployment and continuous de delivery. So as a result, why do we why do we want to do CI/CD? That's because many organizations deploying deploying a new release of code into production takes a huge amount of effort. Uh, well, I remember that I was working for a uh, logistic company, and I think we were deploying once or twice in a week. And for each deployment, we were about spending about six hours or something like that. That was because uh, the code was working on Oracle portal. We were developing code with, uh, by using Oracle portal, uh, Java, and uh, JavaScript, etc. And the main code was generated uh, by using ER diagram. So uh, for to make a deployment, we were first uh, editing the ER diagram, and then we, we had files. So we, the one who will do the deployment we, was reading the files for ERD and creating the relative fields, etc. And then uh, they were by hand. They were checking the uh, changes. So if they fit or not. So if they, if there's something conflict, we need to we have to find it, and then we were able to deploy. And this was taking about six hours or something like that. So uh, it was like a ceremony. But uh, with continuous with, with a software like Jenkins, it just takes maybe 20 minutes, and I don't need to do anything. I just need to send the call. And, uh, Jenkins like or the other systems that I'm integrating with are doing the rest of it, rest of it very well. So basically, it allows me updates, releases much more faster, with higher productivity and sustainability. It's sustainable because uh, everything is optimized, and I have a work a definition of work done. So I have to match it. So uh, for AWS, uh, we won't be touching uh, this components today. But uh, basically, for AWS, they have got a few components that they are using for CI/CD. One of them is AWS Code Pipeline. So it is a fully managed continuous delivery service that it helps you to automate your release pipelines fast and reliable. So uh, this image I take from AWS. So uh, think about this. This is the uh, AWS code pipeline. It basically takes your source, build, test, staging, and production. It does everything. And the thing is, you can integrate it with anything. So uh, basically, for source, you can use uh, AWS Code Build, for example. For building, you can use Jenkins. For testing, you can use Jenkins. And uh, for deployment, you can use uh, AWS Code Deploy. So this is basically this pipeline integrates with anything. So it allows you to. Uh, integrate different services together. That's that's the video for video of it. So it's very customizable, and the thing is, uh, basically, it is uh, it's automated. So it allows you to do rapid delivery because uh, it's auto automating automating your build, test, and release process. Uh, very quick that you could do it uh, by using scripting. So uh, basically, uh, all you need to do is configure your workflow. You are well, by using AWS uh, code pipeline. 
you are uh, designing all of the workflow very easily. And uh, it could basically connect your existing tools, so it could uh, integrate anything. So there is, as well, uh, AWS code build. This is for uh, building the code. So it compiles source code and tests it and uh, creates the software packages that you could deploy. If you want, you can use code build as a working node for existing Jenkins servers for distributed builds. So this is an option. Uh, for this, you could use also Jenkins instances, say Jenkins instances as well. It depends on you, but you could also use code build. And this is a good functionality, I think. And uh, one of the things that it does is uh, it scales up or, up or down. So basically, if you have got enough resources, when you send it to build high, high amount of code, then uh, it could scale it up or down. So uh, you don't have long wait queues for to do your build process. Basically, if there is no, then it will scale. And this is a functionality that, that might be useful because it scales. And basically, you can use your own programming tools or, or you can build your own tools uh, and integrate it to AWS Code Build. And there is AWS Code Deploy. This is the last part of it. Uh, the CICD line, this code deploy, well, what code deploys is, it automates the software development to services like Amazon EC2, Fargate, Lambda, or your own premises service. So it could deploy code to anything. Most probably, for example, what we are doing is we are deploying code to S3, and we are getting it from S3 to build it. And uh, basically, that's the functionality of Jenkins. You can change your build configurations, so you can do uh, you can do build configurations by using environment variables. So what we are doing uh, while we are deploying is uh, we, we only just ha have one uh, configuration file for the project, and if we uh, deploy it from test queue, then basically uh, it gets the test parameters from AWS store and it uses the uh, test account. It gets the parameter from test parameter store with the correct values. And if we are uh, deploying the code for uh, create or building the code for production, then it again use the uh, same build configuration file, same, same configuration file, but uh, since I'm building for production, uh, it gets the values from the production uh, AWS parameter store and uh, you, by using uh, AWS parameter store for values from production. So it's also meant place the links on the fly. So you can consistently deploy your application across your development, test and production environments. And if you want, it creates you push, push not, not notifications about uh, your update, status of your updates. The thing which is good for code deploys, it is uh, platform and language agnostic. So you can integrate it with any platform or any language. So if we talk about Jenkins, uh, as I told, Jenkins uh, is a build tool, I mean, CI-CD tool uh, that first developed in some microsystems. And one of the good part, uh, good functionality of it is uh, you could do, you could create a scalable building infrastructure for yourself. So basically, what you could do is you, you can have one master server and you could have different uh, slave servers. As you see from this slide, 
your uh, different snakes might be Windows, Linux, or MacOS. For example, in our environment, uh, in the environment that I'm working, we have got Linux and Windows slaves. And right now, I think we will create a, Perl, a slave for Perl as well, because we need it. So uh, basically, you can think this slave, this slave might be uh, on-premises servers. So it could be virtual machine. Uh, it could be a Docker container, or it could be anything. So uh, basically, you don't have any limitation about it. And uh, basically, you can, if you want, you can scale mastering instances as well. And by using this master agent uh, mod, uh, it allows you to build a, to create a distributed build architecture. So that if there is if, if the loads increase, then it basically scales. Uh, well, if you think about AWS platform, we have got EC2 instances which are also scalable. So if you want, you can scale your EC2 instances, or if you want, you can scale your uh, Jenkins instances. It depends on you. It depends on you how you integrate it. In such kind of architecture, the best practice is normally uh, you'll see that. Uh, when I create a master, uh, I'm telling that how many instances that I want for uh, building. So I could define three instances, four instances, or whatever. So uh, it will be running three threads or four threads for to build. But if I am running slaves, then what I could do is I could uh, drop that number to zero. So uh, Master server won't be building anything, but it is by using TCP IP or uh, Java network environment, Java network protocol. Uh, it sends the request to slaves, so slaves will be building. And I can scale the slaves as, as much as I want. Basically, this is the best practice for uh, distributed architecture. So master is responsible for pulling the code from the repository and delegate it to uh, slave servers, and slaves will be building and testing. This is the best practice. And so uh, there is a estimated maximum number of jobs. There's a cal calculation. Uh, I don't know how they find it, but. Uh, I think somehow it works. So uh, for to find the number of jobs, then you need to find the, the you need to know the number of developers multiplied by 3.333. So you will have the number of jobs. And if you divide them for 500, then you will calculate how many master servers you need. It could be anything. And then Multiplying the number of jobs by 0 0.03, you will have the you, you will calculate the number of slave servers that you will need. That's the basic calculation for it. So if you know the number of developers that will work on the on project, uh, you could estimate how many master servers and how many slave servers you need to have by using this calculation. So what's special about Jenkins is uh, plugins. It has got lots of plugins. Uh, I've listed some of them here. Uh, th these are some of, the, some of the plugins that we are using. We are not using Gradle, but we are using, for example, uh, Maven plugin, Git plugin. And uh, we are using SonarQ plugin. We are using, for example, SonarQ in most of our uh, building processes. I don't know if any of you use SonarQ before. Yeah. 
Yeah, Nexus also. It has got also Nexus service, yes. And what's so special on Sonar, Sonar Cube? It really finds any security flaw or uh, any code smells on your code. So uh, by default, it's very, it's very restricted. I mean, for example, if you have that, that loss of commands in your code, then it, it could basically fail your code because of it. You have got lots of commands, so just delete that. Or if you use the same variable name as a uh, in, in a function, then it basically fails your code and tells you to define a constant and then use it instead of using the same variable name four times, five times. Sometimes it makes you ill because basically you need to deploy something and uh, you, you, need to sp you are spending lots of time for these kinds of errors, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's working great. Does it work with it like open, open source code and things like that as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it is an open source version. It is also a paid version. So uh, you could configure it anything. I mean, uh, it's fully customizable. So uh, you could tell, tell it to don't give any error or do not fail a quote because there are lots of commands. Or you could tell it to, if there is command for more than three lines in a quote, then fail it. Or uh, Basically, it has got a functionality about if you have a function. And in a function, if you have got too many, too many loops, for example, you have a for, for loop. And then in this for loop, you have got another for loop and two if loops. Then it will probably, by default, fail your code and tell you to split your code in, the, in uh, more readable functions so that it will be much more easier to follow. But it depends on you how to configure it. I mean, uh, you could allow it, I mean, scale it up, up or down, because we are giving a limit. So uh, basically, you are defining some integer about 20, 25, or 30. And basically, it calculates the number of uh, decisions and loops. So if they are inside each other, then it's multiplying by three, by two. And if it is inside of inside of inside something, it multiplies it by six or whatever. So you could easily configure it, configure it, uh, how much com uh, complexity you are allowing in a function, for example. And it also gives errors about if you have got uh, SQL problems. I mean, uh, if you have got uh, SQL injection in your code or such things in security flaws, it's going it's directly giving a given problem. I mean, it, it fails your code. Or if your exam schema, there are, there are some security flaws in exam schemas as well. Mm. So if there is such a case, then it directly fails your code. It won't allow you to compile and send it to staging. And in Jenkins, we also have got pipelines. So we are basically doing everything in pipelines. So basically speaking, in Jenkins, we have got two important things. One of them is plugins because uh, we are expanding the functionality of Jenkins server by using plugins developed. And the other one is pipeline. Because basically, pipeline is the main architecture that we are using for to deploy and build code. So a pipeline is a user-defined model of a CD, continuous delivery pipeline. And it defines your entire build process, which is typically includes states for building an application and testing it, and then delivering it. So 
I have a pipeline, and inside this pipeline, as usual, as usual, as usual we have got uh, nodes. Can you tell me what a node could be? So basically, this is our master service. And uh, we have got stages as well. So basically, by default, we could tell that we have got two, uh, two stages. So we will build the code and deploy the code and then test the code. And uh, we have got steps. In each stage, we will apply some steps. One or more steps to run. So basically, by using stages and steps in a pipeline, uh, we are exactly defining how a build process or how a test process will be, how we will test it or build it. So this is a diagram of it. So here is our development work. Uh, environment and this is our production environment so we start we make the we promise to the repository and then uh, when we commit something to the repository the workflow will start so in first stage it basically gets our source code from say repository and then uh, it collects dependent dependent repositories for example from nexus or whatever and then, in next stage, it begins to build our code. So uh, in this stage, if you want, we can create a Docker instance, or we can use a EC2 instance, or whatever. So we are, in this example, we are using Docker. And then we are basically building our code in this stage. And then the next stage, we are in test, test stage. So we are basically testing, we are running our unit tests and integration tests. And then at last stage, in the deploy stage, we are basically deploying our application. So this is a regular uh, Jenkins pipeline. So there are a few best practices. One of them is uh, always secure Jenkins. What I mean by this is by default, if I don't do anything, for example, I didn't do anything in my in the Jenkins systems that I will show you a few minutes later, uh, it allows any user to do anything. So basically, one of the best practices: do not Jenkins, do not allow Jenkins to do that. Uh, by using there are a few plugins that we could use. By using them or in the integrating with uh, finding user plugins, just apply uh, users some level of security. Because if you don't, then everyone could do anything. If it could run anything like that. In larger systems, don't build on the master. Yes, if you have got a few slaves, then it's not a good idea to be on, on master, then what will you what you will do is uh, just drop the number of executors of master to zero. So it will be scaling its slave instances by using TCP IP. So it, it will be orchestrating the process rather than building it. Uh, this is another thing that we could do. And uh, Take your backup, uh, back your Jenkins on regularly. Also, it's a good idea to limit your project names because sometimes it might be confusing. And for managing dependencies, it's a good idea to use file fingerprinting because that that could be name name conflicts or the dependencies might have. Synonym names, etc. 
it's going to be. And always the clean build from the source code control, because when we to take the latest version, then we can also always uh, do a clean build. It's the best idea. If you want, this could be useful. Uh, we can integrate, integrate it with Jira as well. So if there is any problem in code, etc., it will automatically to drop to Jira so everyone could see that it could be maintainable. And uh, it's a good idea to uh, generate reports and testing when running the when when running your Java build. Another thing is uh, you have to install your uh, Jenkins to, to the partition with most this most free disk space because it, it could basically need lots of space. And I try uh, I use just before removing them, and this is for only one reason. For example, it happens to me nowadays because, uh, well, the company that I'm working for uh, was but basically they begin to develop their software, most of their software with contractors, and about three years later, they three years ago they decided to. Uh, change their policy and they employed some permanent people. I'm working as a contractor in there, but uh, mostly they are using permanent people. And the problem is uh, there are lots of code developed, so sometimes we don't know uh, what is in that, what is developed for what. I mean, the, there could be orphan services, etc. Uh, so uh, this th th this is the main reason for it. So if you basically stop the service, stop the job before removing it, and wait a few days, you may have some complaints about uh, that build is not working anymore, etc. So that you could discover that now it's it's still used by someone or some process. Set up a different job project for each maintenance or development branch you create. That's again a good idea for it because each development branch might have their own uh, requirements. And prevent resource collision in jobs that that are uh, running in parallel. For example, uh, we may be running Docker instances. And they might try to use all of them. Might try to use the same port. So this could, this could be a problem. Avoid scheduling all jobs to start at the same time. That is another problem. Especially we were experiencing this kind of problems by using uh, by using uh, things like parts, etc. Basically, if we have the problem, then it's a, it might be hard to recover. And set up email notifi notifications mapping to all developers in, in the project so that everyone of the team uh, has its pulse, so everyone will be really informed. And then the last thing is uh, ensure that failures are reported as soon as possible. Labels that baseline, baseline is always important for a successful build. Like I told, we mostly using labels in our builds for to put them to production environment, so that we will be exactly sure that uh, what we are sending it to production environment from state. And these are the these are two examples. Uh, that we could use, but you don't, you don't need my GitHub, by the way. But I will be sharing these examples with you. Uh, one of them is deploying a CI CD pipeline by integrating Jenkins with uh, code build and code deploy. 
The other one, I think the project name is wrong. The other one is uh, again from uh, AWS, which is somewhere here. Okay, I will be sharing it. Uh, which is doing uh, basically four lines of uh, AWS code deploy with Jenkins and GitHub. It integrates it with, uh, with AWS deploy, so you might want to take a look. And if you can... here is our AWS. Yeah, I think if you uh, want to continue, maybe we can give five minutes break. No, I think it's okay. I mean, I will just demonstrate it on that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, there are so many things. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I know. Do you, do you need Jenkins with code build and, with code build and code deploy? Uh, you don't have to, but it's always a good idea, yes. I mean, uh, you, you could use them on their own, or you could integrate it done with anything. So you don't have to use Jenkins specifically. But yeah, I mean, uh, they fit good. Could be. Uh, is it alternative solution, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 you could integrate it with anything. I mean, they are also working on their own as well. That's what I mean. Do they have their own? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, yeah, you, you could you could just run that okay. without using Jenkins or anything else. See, I've got the plan to do it. You don't have to use it using yeah. both um, uh, Jenkins or another CI. No. Mm -hmm. I think it's a view. You can see everything at a glance of Jenkins where you cannot really. Yeah. Okay. Well, in Jenkins, this is the basic Jenkins environment. So, basically, uh, this is the Jenkins uh, after how you uh, created it. I will be also sharing you how I created this instance, but uh, basically it takes some time. So it's a better idea to just talk about it and you can implement it as well. So uh, basically I just created a service role at first. So uh, this is the service role statement that uh, I, I used to run. This is the policy that I used to run. Uh, it gives other scaling capabilities for uh, for my server role. And then basically I create a role with this server service role policy, which is called deploy role. And then I define a trust relationship uh, between them. So uh, for to use code deploy, I'm not using it in this instance. I mean, a, not for this instance, but this is how you could, you could integrate it, integrate code deploy with it. So basically, here what I am doing is uh, I'm using EU REST service. So I'm defining code deploy EU REST 2 and EU, EU REST 1. If I don't do that, don't, this, uh, don't do this, uh, I could not be able to get code deploy and install in my system. So I have to make this uh, trust relationship before using uh, code deploying in my Jenkins, in my system. Then I'm creating an instance profile. This is for S3, accessing S3 from e to, e, 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 EC2 instance. And then before, that's how, how I did it, but you could do it after creating EC2 instance as well. Uh, I create my 
the security group. And I allowed basically port 22, port 80, uh, port 300, and then later 600 as, uh, 6000 as well. That's because my example was working on 6000. So I bought open uh, 3000 and 6000, uh, 8000, sorry. Uh, but uh, I didn't use it for every uh, every IP. I just used my computer's IP for to give access, so that it is not open to the world, but just myself. So here is my Is my S3 instance. It's a uh, micro instance. So uh, I'm well inside the basic limits, free tier. But this is my security group. As you see, there's 80, 80, 80. 8,000, 3,000, that's because not yes, and I'm using 22 for SSH, and all of them are uh, allowed from my IP. And then later on, I created my EC2 instance. I used uh, Amazon AMI, but the first one, not the second one. Uh, because uh, I think the second one, they are not installing Java, so you need to install it, but in first one, it was already installed. Then I discovered something, uh, it's installing Java version 7, and uh, Jenkins is not working with Java version 7, it, uh, it, it asks you Java version 8 or 11, so I had to upgrade my Java version. And uh, I use the I use the code with my role. I mean uh, this road for uh, for my EC2 instance. As you see, I can. Uh, this is the role that I am using. This is the trust relationship that I defined that I'm, uh, I already shown you. And these are the code deploy servers so that I could uh, install code deploy. And basically I give access to S3 and uh, service, service role policy that I defined here here and here. So what's that service role is for? So the service role is for uh, scaling. Basically it allows you, uh, it, it gives you EC2. So you created a first role which has the auto scaling capability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you assign that role to uh, the, 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 these are the policy. Yeah, these are the policy. And I, I assign it to this user uh, called, called the word role user. So these are the policies. This is the Java version. This is the S3 policy. And this is the service policy. Basically, this allows me uh, to auto scale the EC2 instance according to the yeah, yeah. Uh, to manage an EC2 instance. I, it allows me to access S3 from this that EC2 instance. What was the trust trust relationship you, you added? Oh, uh, it is this one. Yeah. Uh, well, this is for uh, go that for code deploy. Uh, you need to copy from copy it from S3, 
and then you need to install it. The problem in there is uh, you cannot run this command if you don't have this relation, uh, this trust relationship. It basically denies you. Mm -hmm. You are not authorized. So uh, for to access something in S3 about whole deep dot, you, you need to define this uh, trust relationship so that it will allow you to gain access to the repository. So after creating it, uh, I create a key pair. And then I SSH to the EC2 instance, do a UM update so that I updated all of my uh, executables, install AWS CSI, CLI, and uh, install code deploy agent as well. And I created a S3 bucket. And then uh, I define a code deploy service. So in code deploy, again, it's just uh, ready for code deploy, but I didn't have fine, uh, time to implement it. All you need to do is to implement it to the pipeline. Here it's code deploy. If you take a look, there's a, there's an application and called deploy app. It is working on ECT on premises. So here is the choices. You can use EC2, you can use um, Lambda or ECS. That depends on us. So. Uh, So we are deploying an, an uh, application. And after we are deploying an application, it asks us if we want to deploy a, create a deployment group as well. So these are the deployment groups. So basically, you are assigning a service role for the deployment group to run this the deployment group. Again, I am using. Uh, code deploy raw, but you could define, it's better to define something else. And uh, for my example, I just use in place here as deployment type, but you can use blue green as well. And here uh, in environment configuration, you could choose if you want easy to other scaling groups, which I don't have or uh, easy to end instances, you could give value. For example, I give a value name called pod deploy for to easily identify my pod deploy instance. As you see, it automatically finds it since I have it. And then I'm not using a load balancer, but yes, I believe you could use it. I'm not using it because it just makes it complicated, much more complicated. After this configuration, which I am using, I install Jenkins and I install Docker. This is how I install Docker. Here. And this is how I installed Jenkins. I use vegan and then install it. Uh, you need, to, uh, you need to at first download the key and then import it by using I, RPM import and then install Jenkins. Then you need to create the groups. This is also important because uh, if you don't create these groups, then uh, you will have problems with uh, running with Docker. And we will be using Docker for to compile our instance. And here I need to uh, install Java because it came to work. It, it came with Java 1.7, and this pseudo alternative for Java is just allows you to choose Java version. 
And then finally, I'm starting Jenkins and uh, Docker services. When I first uh, run my Jenkins instance, I need to go to the IP and uh, this port. It shows me a screen. I'm not sure if there is, but uh, it shows me a screen that uh, I need to enter a password. It, at time, it automatically assigns an admin password. And uh, if you have shell terminal working in background, it's telling you that password. Or you need to go uh, this directory to get the password. And you need to uh, write that password. And then it gives you the option to install Plugins, install suggested plugins or choose one by one. The ideal approach is to choose one by one, of course, but uh, it, can, it can be time consuming. So I just use to install the suggested plugins. And then I installed some extra plugins. I installed Blue Ocean, uh, AWS Pipeline, AWS Steps. Code deploy, code pipeline, code build, and AWS EC2. Now I will tell you why I installed AWS EC2 as well. So here, at first, let me see. Here I told about the executors. So this is the number of processes when I try to build something on master. So if I am using slave service, it's ideal that I just put zero here, so it won't be building anything. It will be basically directing every build operation to its slaves. Then you could configure it if you want to use it just generally or just for specific labels. So basically, you could use this master or this or the slaves just for specific projects as well. In our case, for example, in the company that I am working, uh, we have got slaves and we need to call the guys from India, uh, ask them to, we, we, we will make a deployment. So uh, get the slaves online. So uh, they are putting it online and we are deploying. That's for security reasons, because it, it also depends on you. Uh, this is your Jenkins URL. And here there are some settings, like meetup, etc. That's because I installed too much things. I mean, by default, it's installing all of, most of it. So at, at now, there is a separate configuration page. If I click here, it takes me another page. Now, here is the tricky part. Uh, if you see, I could come here from, as well, uh, from Manage Notes section. I'll show it also. Uh, this is the part of AWS plugin, AWS EC2 plugin. So what we are doing is uh, we are basically giving a name, and it automatically gets your credentials. And after it gets your credentials, basically it gives you the login regions, etc., access to regions. And then you will be able to put the EC2 payer private key. And after you say, OK, uh, if you want here, you can choose EMIs that you want to use as well. So what this does is basically, normally, what I need to do, this is my master. If I need to create a, uh, oh, it has got no swap space. Uh, normally, if I need, a, need to create a slave server, 
then I need to give it a uh, not name and uh, it must be a permanent agent. So I need to create an AC2 instance and assign it uh, to uh, this layer. So uh, by doing this and defining this, I told uh, Jenkins that it could uh, generate as much slave servers as it needs. So basically, while trying to compile something, if this master guy wouldn't be able to make it, then it will basically scale more uh, EC2 instances from Jenkins cloud. I with this uh, this opportunity, this this definition by configuring the cloud. And when you were using the the Docker, like uh, for what? I'm showing. You. Also, what are you what are you um, where are you specifying whether it's for Windows builds, Linux builds, or whatever? It's all uh, it's all in pipeline. So in pipeline. yeah. So this is the plugins page, and you can see all available plugins, all installed plugins, and all, if you want to configure uh, your plugins. This is the EC2 plugin that I showed you. You can basically choose your plugins and configure them from here. So again, uh, back to here. I've got two opportunities here. I can use new item to uh, create the free slide project pipeline or multi configuration pipeline uh, or multi branch pipeline. I can use that. Between them? Hmm? What's the difference? Uh, this basically creates a pipeline, regular pipeline. Uh, this creates a pipeline that you could use with multiple configurations. So there will be a configuration file for test, and there will be a configuration file for production. So same project, but for if you are building for test, it's using one of them. For production, it's using one of them. Or if you want, you can use just one product by using scripting, Groovy script, etc. You can just use one production, one configuration. And uh, multi branch uh, is if you have got multiple branches. And here I use Blue Ocean. That's why I installed it because uh, it could be much more easier to use Blue Ocean. This is my sample application. For to create my sample application, at first uh, in this sample application, I didn't have got any Jenkins file. So uh, for Jenkins to run a uh, pipeline, it needs a Jenkins file. So you need to show the location of the Jenkins file. If there is no Jenkins file, then uh, it tells you if you want to create one, then you could create it. So here is my Jenkins file. This is how I define my deployment. So uh, basically, like I told before, this is my pipeline. It has got stages, install packages, test and build, and uh, deployment, production, etc., which I will visualize here. That's why I like uh, this guy. Yeah, it shows it. Here it is. So uh, this is this is install packages part of it. This is test build part of it. This is run test part of it. This is I have got two choices. It might be a production or it might be a staging one. So I could basically see it from here. And I will show you how you can design from here as well. So uh, here I have got the agent, and for agent I've got Docker. This means that I'm telling the, telling it that uh, using Docker image, not uh, tan alfin, 
which is a small Docker image uh, as a Docker image and open ports for 3,000 3, and 8,000. So basically, when I run the pipeline, it first creates a Docker image, run, run, runs this Docker image. And then it begins to uh, run my stages. At first stage, at first stage, it runs npm install, so it installs my npm packages, and then it runs a uh, test SS circuit, which is which is here, basically what it does is run NPM test. So it's just a bit the basic one. Nothing very complicated. And then uh, basically it runs NPM build. And if you see, they are in the same, uh, same stage. That's why we, we define them as parallel, so they are working in parallel. So it's running the test and it's running the IBM, uh, NPM build. And then basically it comes to the deployment stage. In deployment stage, I've got two options. If I'm running it for the staging branch, then you know, the, this operation, so it basically connects to AWS by using EUS2 for credentials, I'm telling about it. It does a S3 DDD upload, and then it may it sends a mail. I think mail part might not might not be working, not sure. And then it runs the deliver for development SH. It waits for 100 seconds, and then it kills the uh, it kills the instance. It's because I don't want to rerun the Docker instance forever. I mean, for my specific purpose. So if I run it, from branches, it tells me it begins to run. So I can see each stage. So first it will create, uh, so the master uh, Jenkins was running, there was no slave agents running, so now... Uh, it could be, I mean it depends on, because I didn't, uh, I didn't configure it for zero, so if it needs uh, slave agents, then it will basically create that. It will create EC2 instance for the slave agents, and then now you are running a pipeline where the first step is to create a Docker image. Yes, and as you see, here is my application. Right now I can access my application. This is an application that I find in, in Net. I was planning to use another one, but it was basically using too, much, too many resources, so I couldn't be able to. For micro instance, even this one is bulky enough, you cannot easily SSH to the box because it won't, it, it won't respond to you easily. As you see right now, my instance is up and I can uh, access to this instance. But after hundreds, uh, hundreds seconds, it will basically get to timeout. Where, where is your own code? Is it on your laptop? Or where is it? <laughs> uh, I'm running it directly from AC2. I mean, Amazon. There is nothing in my laptop. This Jenkins file is basically in GitHub. There is nothing yeah. running on my laptop. I'm running everything from. Uh, uh, no, you, you, you're built, you're doing a um, test on your code, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, on AWS, I am doing the test. Yeah. So where is it? Where is the code repository? On GitHub. Huh, yeah, it, 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 it's it's on GitHub. It, it, yeah, 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 this one. Okay. This yeah. 
I set the codes on GitHub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Then, then, then the you're doing what's triggering the build. Uh, if I commit something, it is triggering it, and it, what's triggering the test? Sorry, the test. He did it manually. He did it manually. Yeah. So no. Oh, the test script is is uh, the test script is here are here are my scripts. So in test stage, this is my script. But how it triggers is another thing. Uh, uh, basically, I have to learn these things as well. Uh, you want to update anything? The the web books. No, no, uh, yeah. Third one. Yeah. You need to define web book. It's not working, I think, right now. So basically, this is the correct password. Yeah. So basically, you need to make this definition. So this allows you, if something updated on your code pipeline in GitHub, it allows you it allows Jenkins to pull it. So it it sends an information to Jenkins to that to tell that that's what the web web could test. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I could, you could also define uh, which events you want to trigger. Yeah. It is pull and push. Well, I think credentials are wrong. So currently, so it, 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 it run because I trigger it manually yeah. by by by, uh, by triggering playing uh, but so pressing why, the play button. Why did it directly go into production? Like uh, I didn't understand that part. So, so you, you create a, a Docker image, you deploy your application, it it build it, test it, and then it's deploying and going into the production. Ideally. The thing which is better is going to staging and then production. Correct. So why, like, what? Uh, the, 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 this because I didn't have much time, so. Uh, no, no. So what was the condition in your uh, uh, Jenkins file? Huh. Well, uh, it's not because of my Jenkins file. It's because of my. Oh, okay. Somehow it's Jen. It is a Jenkins file. I mean, uh, it is a definition because production is looking to the master, and I'm in master branch. I'm using the master branch. Okay. So that is the definition. As you see, this uh, brand case here defines the staging, branch. Staging, correct. Yeah, but you did it in master, so that's why it went down. Yeah, it, it, it went down to the, okay, to the master, uh, to the production. Okay. So after 100 seconds or whatever, that uh, the, the Docker image will get killed and your application yeah. will stop working, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, that, that's not running on EC2, correct? The, your Node.js is running on Docker, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, what I could say is... Here are my credential files. So this is the EC2 instance. And what's this, the master? Yes, this is the master. This is the Jenkins server, but I don't yeah, I don't have any space. Yeah, I don't have any space left. That's why I couldn't show you that. That for instance is not running yeah, in here. <laughs> but anyhow, you get killed now if you go back. Yes, uh, I think it's not getting killed. That's because no I got no space. <laughs> okay, okay that's good. Wow, well, yeah. But no, no space to create the um, can, the uh, it, Docker instance. Yeah, it has some space to create the Docker instance, but. No, it's uh, 
What's, what 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 did they, did they have space for? Yeah, maybe it, since they, it has no the temporary space, swap space, uh, basically it couldn't. Yeah, you need a bigger the, instance of uh, EC2 than it would run from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's giving segmentation file because uh, it doesn't have enough space to do the operations. Mm -hmm. the, the, mom, the memory is full, Docker is somehow working, but it's at the right. le, 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 le maximum space, stay, yes. Right. So yeah. that's why it's failed. So it created the Docker, but it didn't put the or it didn't put the application on there. Well, uh, basically, it that is because this application is yeah, this EC2 instance is running for about four hours or something. So it's a micro instance that's running four hours or something. And this is, I think, my twenty-seventh one of it or something. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the reason of it. If I restart the instance or uh, if I, if I create a new EC2 instance, then it will be okay. Uh, ideally, what you will do is uh, taking an AMI or something, and then using that AMI or using that Docker image rather than uh, trying to compile, uh, rather than doing npm install or etc. But yes, you could also uh, do this. So does the GitHub has that uh, your initial script as well? Like what are the roles? Hmm. And, uh... Well, uh, at the beginning it doesn't. Oh, okay. So the thing is not here. Oh, uh, no, no. But uh, at the beginning there was no this Jenkins file. I created, I created it manually, and uh, basically there is a way to do that. We are running out of time, okay. Okay, here, uh, if there is no Jenkins file, then it automatically takes you this screen. And this screen is for Ocean Blue. It allows you to visually uh, design your Jenkins file. Here is my start point, and uh, this, has, this has the uh, Docker instance settings. And uh, this is the install packages setting, and this is the uh, test field, and create real life facts step by step. You can see it there. Yeah, this is really nice, nice playing. Yeah. yeah, it's showing everything. So, this is the. Uh, this creates the file, does it? The yes, this file. creates the file. Can you download it? Later on, so we don't have to go and click and click again. Yeah. Will it create it somewhere? Uh, can you say? So, so what you're saying is, can you save it as a file? Something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, Basically, like, 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 this creates the Jenkins uh, file. But where would they put it? Because now it will automatically put into your code base. Maybe you have to go on the Jenkins itself instead. Oh, or it, it automatically commits it to your code base. Oh. So you don't have to do do that even. I mean, uh, if I delete this, yeah, I do. <laughs> I I I made a demonstration so I can <laughs> I could basically break it. No, that's why I leave it. Uh, do it final time. Yeah. <laughs> <Leave it. laughs> well, I will just copy paste. <laughs> When I was talking about the file which was uh, to create the EC2 instance in the AWS, that's what I was talking about. Not this one, the one which you showed before. Uh, which one? Oh, the one that black, that black, the black, 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 yeah, because we, we first we need to do this and then we can do the tracks so we need this one first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So where, and where, here, where is this reside then normally? Would this one also be in, in the code repository? Uh, no, I, uh, I, I just created it for myself. Yeah. These are my notes, so yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Maybe the cloud, uh, cloud formation template, you can do it here. Or, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, by the way, it, it, ideally, 
it could be a cloud formation type, but a, or a, at least if you are creating Docker instances, for example, a cloud formation template is a good idea because then uh, you could create the same Docker instance, exactly the same configuration for the Docker instances, etc. So it's a good idea. But yes. for this, uh, I implemented it manually because it's a better idea to show it. Yeah. But the problem is, uh, if I try to show it, I think we will need another one hour or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why I'm demonstrating it. Yeah, by the way, you know, uh, Jenkins is uh, really complicated for it is, it is. We, all these days, uh, especially for the microservice management. You know, I think it is, uh, yeah, it is, uh, you can do still everything, but it needs so much effort, you know, all these days. That's why, my, especially for the microservice management, people using the Azure DevOps, Circuit CI, Travis, maybe you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, not need to anything. Yeah, putting only one YAML file uh, in your uh, microservice automatically. See, yeah, uh, you can integrate it with CI/CD. But if you, uh, in my idea, if you manage your uh, project via Jenkins, everything will be under your control. Because if you want to use Jenkins, you have to know, right? Mm. By chance, yes. something can occur. <laughs> but the uh, if you look at the circuits here, for example, yeah, sign up uh, and you are paying. After that, everything starts work, you know, because it's automatically mm. integrating with GitHub and automatically integrating with AWS. Oh, well, it might have uh, some paid components, so I'm sure that if you pay them, then <laughs> they will pay anything for you. Uh, what is the general practice for branching strategy? Do you recommend having like a development branch, uh, testing branch, and production, and then the master, or generally like yeah, generally master is the main one to write? Yeah, it's, uh, it depends. I mean, in my place, we are using uh, mostly test and production. Uh, but also, also we are, sometimes we are using them as well. So they have just information. Yeah. yeah, because if you use, if you try to try to use them, then we are also just three developers or something like that. So okay. it's it, it basically it's another level of complexity, and uh, we are deploying it through Jenkins. So uh, basically, we have the opportunity to see everything in test environment before deploying it to production environment. And since we are deploying it through automation, uh, it is exactly as we defined. So, but it's a, if, so say for example, if it's a dev branch, and then you have a test, and then production, and the master. Mm -hmm. So, if I did the feature branch from the dev, uh, I created something, everything I tested, everything is fine, I merged into dev. Yeah. Yeah, so here, then you need to merge, then you need to deploy into staging and then production, correct? Yes. So how, how do you write your uh, core pipeline saying that when, what needs to be built? So say, for example, you know Python? Yes. Yeah, so uh, my first step is like linting, and then I'm, I'm trying to do a build. So in my, because the my core pipeline will be looking in the master branch and not the dev, so how I can run my board pipeline? Do you huh. understand my question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the, that is what uh, we experienced. I mean, uh, that, that was our main problem because uh, basically all of our costs, because we, we, we are using AWS uh, parameter store. Yeah. Uh, for every environment, uh, our parameter store called uh, the URLs are different, keys are different. Yeah, so uh, you, since keys are different, we need to manipulate uh, those keys for each environment, and we, we did it through Jenkins. So uh, basically, we compile, try to compile something, uh, it has a template, it replaces it. With the right general name. And then it's applying it. So uh, basically, I just closed the uh, projection. Uh, it has got to define environment variables. And for each envi different environment, you can define a template, something, and then you can apply it. So it doesn't matter 
which environment are you are deploying? You are basically using the correct uh, environment variables. So you are basically deploying just one block. Yeah, but uh, you know, as a as a best practice, you know, according to your uh, project. Uh, uh, project nature, you can find different solutions. But for example, we are using, you know, uh, the uh, the best uh, and staging uh, you know, demo environment, also record and report. We have several uh, environment, you know, uh, at the end of the uh, pipeline when we. Uh, deploy everything uh, to abroad properly. We are merging with the master branch because on the dev to test test to other environment, if something goes wrong, you know, if you merge uh, with the master branch later, it is not easy to roll back. Sometimes uh, your master branch getting complicated. That's why uh, everything, uh, if uh, when we uh, when we properly deploy to uh, all environment, the the end uh, 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 the end of the pipeline is broke, right? Mm -hmm. Something works fine on the code. Uh, I am uh, you know comfortably can merge with the master branch, mm -hmm. and I'm merging at the end of the pipeline. We are uh, so yeah we are creating uh, uh, when we take new uh, vector from the uh, need tickets from the backlog, uh, creating feature branch, and then the uh, developer deploys the dev branch. We are reviewing after that step by step of the approval. No, no, so you know, what I'm trying to say, yeah, yeah. So, so say for example, this is your master branch, yeah. and this is your dev branch, this is your staging, this is your production. Say for example, in my code pipeline, uh, which is triggering my master branch, uh, yeah, I, I will have uh, something called as like first step linting, um, yeah. second step. So, so on, uh, for example. We have call it or maybe yeah. unit testing, whatever. Third is like third is depending on the rate of, uh, yeah. or maybe you say for example build. Build is a format. Fourth is I want to do something like depending on the environment variable. So say for example if it's dev, then deploy it in dev. Uh, if it's uh, staging, then I want some control gateway like uh, wait for approval. Yeah. Uh, and if it's production, check uh, uh, for approval. Plus, is it something they've deployed like right now, staging or not? Test or something, yeah. something like this. So, this is my pipeline. Mm -hmm. But whenever I put something in development, I will pass it as variable as dev. Then it will do lane, it will do the build, mm -hmm. and, it will, and then it should stop here. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, and then, uh, say for example, if I merge, uh, no, uh, merge it to staging, then it will continue to staging. Yeah. So, what it, it should yeah. merge to, <laughs> not master, in my idea. Yeah, it should merge yeah. to staging. No, so how this, like, my development is finished now, what do I need to do? Well, uh, in, in the in my example, what it does is uh, basically after you after you did this one, then well, well, well when you, uh, what you could do is basically you can commit it, commit code to uh, staging here in this step. So if you try to run this code, then it will be next time uh, identified as staging at this time it will be good. It, 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 will it, it will trigger for production. So basically, what you need to do is uh, just you could do something like I did uh, when uh, staging, when production, when etc. And you could do uh, commit. Okay. Commit your code to next level. Oh, so, so he, that would be the step here, like yeah, but, but, then commit to staging and then. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And if you want, like I thought, you could, you could use the environment variables as well. So uh, you could set environment variables if there is, if it is there, then set these environment variables to these values, etc. So you. Can so yeah, I, I was using the environment variable directly here. So then, do I need the three two different branches? Because then, if I'm using environment variable, then I don't need a separate branch. 
Oh, yes, but uh, think about it. You want to come to the next stage. Do you want to go straight ahead from Possibly you want to stop at some since so you are in that you will point so you will be in next time. So next time when you try to load the load this file, I mean if something changes in stage uh, in staging, then we'll try to commit it to production. 